Uh, welcome uh, to the public meeting on uh, health and social services and education, cultural employment on child and youth mental wellness action plan. Um, I'd like to welcome the ministers and their staff for showing up. Uh, before we start, I'm going to ask Minister Bolio to open up with a prayer. Merci. Health Department Education <clears throat> um, before we start, uh, I'll get uh, the members to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Mr. Blake. Hi, Frederick Blake, I'm a lay for Mackenzie Delta. I'm Tom Bolio, I'm a lay for Tuneda Willoughby. Michael Nadvi, I'm a lay for Detro. <clears throat> Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Uh, welcome, uh, Shane Thompson, Nahende. I'm also the chair of social development. At this point in time, which minister should I? Minister Abernathy will get you to introduce your staff, and then Mr. Moses can do that, and then we'll start from there. Or he's going to do all the introductions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you uh, to committee members for having us here today. I'd like to uh, thank you and your committee for the invitation, for the opportunity to discuss the Joint Department of Health and Social Services, Education, Cultural Employment, New Child and Youth Counselor Initiative uh, with you today. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, Alfred Moses. Uh, and with us, we do have a number of individuals from the Department of Health and Social Services and the Department of Education. Uh, culture and employment. We have uh, Mr. Bruce Cooper, who is the Deputy Minister, Patricia Kyle, who is the Assistant Deputy Minister for Families and Communities, uh, Sarah Tortakowski, who is the Manager of Mental Health and Addictions, uh, Kate Sills, the Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister, and Susan Laramie, who is the Special Ministerial Advisor. From Education and Culture and Employment, we have Sylvia Hayner, the Deputy Minister, Olin Lovely, the Assistant Deputy Minister, Corporate Services, Rita Mueller, the Assistant Deputy Minister, Education and Culture, uh, Julia Mott, Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister, and Myla Page, who is the Special Ministerial Advisor. Uh, Mr. Chair, with, in speaking with youth from across the Northwest Territories, we've heard loud and clear that there's a need for accessible counselling supports that are available in a variety of settings and delivered in youth-friendly and non-judgmental ways. In response to this, we have partnered with the Department of Education, Culture and Employment to create 42 child and youth care counselor positions and seven clinical supervisor positions to be added to our existing services. Uh, this initiative represents a truly collaborative and integrated approach between the health and social services and education systems. And most importantly, Mr. Chair, will allow for a holistic, integrated and therapeutic approach to better meet the needs of children and youth in the Northwest Territories. Uh, child and youth counselors will be available in both school and community settings and will provide specialized mental health care and support to young people across the territory. Uh, they will also be able to act as a resource for teachers and school staff, as well as family members and adults who play an important role in the lives of children and youth. The initiative pays dividends to the hard work, planning and partnership <coughs> forged through the development of the Child and Youth Mental, Health, Mental Wellness Action Plan and the Guiding Strategic Framework. Through this initiative, we will significantly increase the overall mental health and wellness supports in almost every school and community in the Northwest Territories. This proposal is truly transformational as it has been informed by the voices of Northern youth themselves and provides them with the supports they require in a manner that best reflects their needs. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would like to ask the two Assistant Deputy Ministers, Patricia Kyle and Rita Mueller, to lead us through the presentation. And following the presentation, Minister Moses and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Minister <coughs> the, uh, who will we start? Ms. Kyle? Okay, Ms. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so slide one. For this presentation, we'll provide an overview of the Child and Youth Mental Wellness Action Plan. 
what we heard from youth about their mental wellness needs, our current services and identified gaps, what we propose with the child and youth care counselling positions, our proposed implementation plan, and the rationale for our proposed implementation approach. Next slide. So, the history of the Northwest Territories is filled with stories of strength and resilience in the face of adversity and a strong commitment to the land, culture, language, communities, and one another. While this strength is undeniable, we also know that the legacy of colonization and residential schools presents a very real challenge for the wellness of many Northwest Territories residents today. Intergenerational impacts and trauma continue to affect many of our families and are felt in all of our communities. This is evident in our territory's rate of substance misuse, family violence, child and family services involvement, school dropout rates, suicide rates, unemployment and poverty. Yet despite these challenges, there are many committed people in our communities who are working hard to keep communities healthy and support people around them. <coughs> communities and schools know what they need and our goal is to ensure that the mental health and addiction services available are available and to recognize these strengths in order to foster hope, self-determination and ultimately recovery. Slide three. The Child and Youth Mental Wellness Action Plan was developed by the Department of Health and Social Services in collaboration with other social envelope departments, including education, culture and, and employment, municipal and community affairs, and justice. The action plan was also guided by the results of four separate youth engagement efforts that together captured the feedback of approximately 130 youth, youth from every region of the Northwest Territories. We collaborated with our partners at FOXY, SMASH, MACA's Youth Ambassadors Program, and the Back to the Trail Youth Gathering. Youth had very clear feedback for us about what they want in wellness services. Strengths. Youth expressed the importance of not seeing them in terms of deficits. They want to be recognized as resilient, creative, and knowledgeable. Safety. Youth spoke about the importance of having access to services that are flexible and delivered in a youth-friendly, non-judgmental manner. Privacy. Many youth spoke passionately about their need and feelings that their information needs to be kept private and confidential. Many of them told us about the fear of not having their privacy um, not having privacy leads them to not accessing services that they know they need and are waiting until a situation is critical before they reach out for professional help. Choice. Youth also spoke about the fact that they are all different. One size does not fit all. And when it comes to the type of services that they want or how they want to access those services, youth made it clear that options are critical. Slide four. In the Northwest Territories, there is a range of service options available for mental health and addiction supports. This spans early ages to adulthood and from prevention programming to counseling to specialized intensive treatment. The Northwest Territories Child and Youth Mental Wellness Action Plan contains activities designed to enhance, strengthen, and improve each of these program areas. However, it was felt that a priority needs to be the provision of specialized and dedicated resources to support child and youth mental wellness in schools and at the community level. Slide five. As an important first step towards meeting the unique needs of children and youth, we are proposing a collaborative approach between health and social services and education, culture and employment which would see child and youth care counselors employed in many Northwest Territories communities with a traveling team of specialists to provide counseling supports to our smallest communities. This approach is in line with the mandate of the 18th Assembly by prioritizing our improvements to outpatient mental health services with a particular focus on child and youth mental health in schools and in the broader community. 
as well as addressing the gaps in integrated community-based services. This approach is also aligned with Mind and Spirit, the Northwest Territory's strategic framework for mental health and addictions. It focuses on a whole of government approach, as well as prevention and early intervention. Slide six. <coughs> The child and youth care counselors will be placed in schools and communities who have, and they have expertise in working with children, youth, and their families. The child and youth care counselors employed through this initiative would be health and social service employees who work as part of our community counseling program team and who also receive clinical supervision through that program. Additional clinical supervisors who are our senior clinical counselors are part of this proposal in order to adequately support and provide direction to each of these child and youth care counselors and their teams. It is important to note that a large portion of the child and youth care counselors time would be spent working with children and youth in a school setting in order to provide ease of access to students wishing to connect with them and to act as a much needed resource for school staff. It is also important to note that the child and youth care counselors would also have office space within the community and would be available outside of school hours year round to be accessible to all children and youth who might require their services outside of the school setting. The counselors will be part of a larger continuum of mental health and wellness services for children and youth and would have strong integrated relationships not only with school staff but with other community staff including social workers, nurses, doctors, youth centre staff and others. This is important to facilitate wraparound services and a holistic approach to care. This initiative will meet the needs that youth express to us. They want specialized, professional, youth-specific mental wellness resources that deliver services in an integrated fashion that are less formal and flexible. The implementation of child and youth care counselors into schools and communities represents an improvement in the way we provide mental health services for children and youth across the Northwest Territories. Slide seven. <coughs> Pass on to my colleague. Thank you, Ms. Kyle. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The traveling team uh, will be based on a pilot that we have uh, been running for the past three years in some of our smallest communities. This traveling team uh, will be made up of counselors and specialists uh, from, a mem from members of an organization called Northern Counseling and Therapeutic Services. And uh, as partners, they have been providing week-long um, counseling services in some of our smallest, uh, 10 smallest uh, communities so far. Uh, this uh, model of service is proposed uh, to continue for 11 communities, which include Jean Marie, Nahani Butte, Sambake, Wrigley, Polituck, Saks Harbor, Sigachik, Coville Lake, Gamati, Wakwati, and Katlodichi. And in these uh, schools, um, they will receive a minimum of three week-long trips into their uh, community each year. And in between those trips, uh, students and staff will have access to video conferencing, teleconferencing, email and text support. If we can move to slide eight. Both departments recognize that there is a need for enhanced mental health services in every one of our regions. However, we felt it was important that we take our time to ensure a careful and thoughtful approach to the rollout and implementation. Health and Social Services and ECE worked collaboratively to determine an evidence-informed approach to this four-year proposed uh, phased implementation. <coughs> this approach begins in 2018-19 with the rollout within the Decho and the Clicho regions. Areas that the departments considered in this decision included existing services that might, might uh, exist right now within those communities, frontline staff observations, quantitative data including early development instrument data, middle years development instrument data for grades four and seven students, and also health and social services, child and family services data. In addition, 
to that to that evidence. Uh, both departments also felt that the Cleetro region was uh, unique in the fact that uh, the Cleetro Community Services Agency has already a combined governance over education, health, and social services program, which would provide us with a unique opportunity to build on existing integration. As we know, this is an initiative that we will be of interest to our students, our families, and communities in all regions. And we really want to work together in a, the most collaborative way to create a comprehensive communications plan to make sure that everyone is aware of the services that will be provided. <coughs> Slide nine. The results of uh, the Early Development Instrument, or EDI, give us a snapshot into the lives and experiences of our youngest children in their first uh, five years um, of their lives and when they are in kindergarten for five-year-olds. It also can give information about the current development abilities in any given population that early childhood programs and or parents can use to focus their support for their young children as they grow and prepare for school. EDI looks at five main domains, the physical health and well-being, the social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, and communication and general knowledge of these five-year-old children. Uh, we know from the EDI results in the Northwest Territories um, <coughs> that uh, when we have a vulnerability in any of these domains, especially two of the domains, that it really um, uh, affects children's growth and development. Overall, 37% uh, of children in our small communities are vulnerable in at least two of the domains. As well, we, uh, when health and social services looked at their child and family service data and they reviewed all the regional rates of children with a child um, and or involved in child and family services status, both the Clicho and the Decho regions had the highest rates per 1,000 children. Slide 10. The Middle Years Development Instrument, which is um, completed by grades four and seven children on an annual basis, is a tool that measures the development of, the, of these age uh, group children and is strongly linked to their well-being. Research has shown that the experiences that children have in these middle years, and basically from ages six to 12, have critical and long-lasting effects on their development. These experiences, as well as the environments in which children are spending their time, are often powerful predictors of happiness and success later in their lives. The MDI data provides us with a window into the world of children who are at this critical stage of their development. The, well, the Well-Being Index is a combined score of five measures that are known to be of critical importance to the development of children's overall well-being. These measures include happiness, health, optimism, self-esteem, and what's referred to as low sad sadness. When comparing regions across the territory, both the Clicho and the Decho had much higher proportions of children experiencing what's referred to as low well-being than the territorial average. <coughs> when comparing regions across the territory, in particular in the grade seven cohort, um, both the Clicho and the Decho again had higher proportions of children, children self-identifying in what they called low well-being um, compared to the territorial average. And now, uh, Mr. Chair, it's if I could go back to my colleague. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Ms. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So slide 11. Uh, the number of full-time students was a determining factor in how many full-time counselors will be available within a school and community. And these allocations are consistent with typical national ratios in this field of work. Slide 12. Um, so for Decho. The three largest Dato commu community schools will have a full-time child and youth counselor, 
and the four small communities will receive services from the traveling team. Both will also be connected to the community counseling program. Due to the fact that the new child and youth care counselors will be in, uh, joining the existing health and social services community counseling program teams, there's also a need to ensure adequate clinical supervision supports for all of the full-time counselors. Clinical supervision is an important to the work of all counselors, but it is particularly critical when working with a child and youth population. So where the addition of the child and youth care counselors has increased the total regional counselor comp complement to more than eight counselors in total, an additional clinical supervisor has been added to ensure adequate and timely access to clinical supervision for all child and youth care counseling staff. Slide 13. Through this initiative, in the communities of Wati and Bechako, they will have a total of four child and youth care counselors, and the two smallest communities will have access to the, tra to the traveling team. And again, both will be connected to the community counseling program. As well, there'll be an additional clinical supervisor position hired to help support the counselors. Slide 14. The total investment over four years is 42 child and youth care counselors and seven clinical supervisors. In the first year, there will be four positions for the DECHO, five for the CLECHO, and this is in addition to the work of the traveling team. <coughs> Slide 15. The overall cost of this initiative, once rolled out over the next four years, will be just over $7 million. This $7 million includes new funding of approximately $3.8 million and the reallocation of existing Education Authority funding of approximately $3.3 million. Mr. Chair, back to my colleague. Thank you, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Slide 16. The Department of uh, Education, Culture and Employment as well as Health and Social Services have already met and discussed this initiative with our Education Authority Superintendents of Education in order to get their input and suggestions. Superintendents have indicated that they are very pleased that both departments are working together on this initiative because they feel that this is one that is uh, critical uh, for the children and youth that they serve. Superintendents have also been part of uh, shaping the job description for the, um, for the counselor positions. However, this initiative is not going to be without its challenges. In some cases, education authorities have already hired a qualified counselor or counselors with their current counseling and wellness funding that they receive. Um, one, of the, one of the things that is still um, being looked at and we're working with education authorities is to see of those counselors that are currently employed, which will meet the qualifications um, of these new positions. Some education authorities are using uh, their school community and wellness counseling position funding to employ extra teachers or classroom support assistants and not necessarily counselors. These non-counseling positions will not be able to continue once the initiative begins because this funding must be used for the intent, which is to hire qualified mental health counselors. There um, will be certain individual positions that may be impacted and are no longer available due to the proposed changes. Education authorities who are in this situation are two or three years away from implementation. And therefore, in working together with superintendents in both departments, we believe that we will be able to have an effective plan in place for anyone that would be affected. These are not easy decisions to make, but the mental well-being of our children and youth is fundamental to their overall success in school and to their overall health and their outcomes in life. This initiative is trying to respond directly to the voices of the NWT youth and to what educators principals and superintendents have been saying is needed within schools for many years. This work must be a priority. In slide 17, 
In order for the initiative to be ready for implementation, both departments have been and will continue to meet with education authorities and with health authorities to plan all aspects of this four-year rollout. Both departments met with superintendents when they were here last, a few weeks ago at the end of January, and our next meeting with all superintendents is on February the 19th here in Yellowknife. The superintendents of education will be part of reviewing not only job descriptions, but also helping to develop the communication plan and also intimately involved in any review of staffing considerations and processes. The most important need, of course, is to ensure that the Decho and Clicho regions are fully staffed prior to the beginning of this upcoming 2018-19 school year, which begins in August of 2018. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. <clears throat> Any comments, questions for the ministers in regards to this proposal? Mr. Blake. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sure um, it's all is based on numbers, so a lot of these programs are <clears throat> rolled out, and <clears throat> I know Zigachik is going to take exception to this. Uh, once again, it'll have uh, people coming in, you know, a couple of times a week, and, you know, um, they always feel that they're being left out. They, what they'd like to see is have a counselor in the community available at all times, and, you know, and Many times of these programs that are being rolled out, the uh, smaller communities are being left out, uh, uh, providing these services that are much needed. Most most times, it's in the smaller communities, and um, I'm hoping the department can make those changes and provide these full-time positions in the small communities that's much needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this was certainly a discussion that the departments have had uh, amongst themselves, but with also with uh, with partners. There's there's no question that we want to be able to provide as many services to all of our students as possible. Uh, but from a practical point of view, when the when the student enrollment is less than 75 individuals, it's very difficult to, for us to find permanent staff to put into these types of positions. And we want to make sure that they're that they're being utilized to the full of their their scope and capacity at all times which is why we feel at this time that the travel team is going to be able to provide quality service to some of our smaller communities. Uh, there will be people traveling in, but there will also be people available uh, via other mechanisms, whether it's the, the internet and or direct phone calls so that our residents in those smaller communities, the youth, could have direct <coughs> access to high quality professionals uh, year round, uh, school year, non-school year, uh, at, at all times. Thank you, Mr. Abernathy. Mr. Bolio. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think this is a, a very good initiative. I think it'll be something that would be uh, very positive for uh, for the uh, members of the community, the youth. I um, I see that from from the numbers that uh, uh, from my riding, um, uh, it's, it would indicate that there would be a full time. Uh, uh, position and for resolution and a full-time position in DILO. Um, and then includes LK could be right on the borderline on whether or not an individual is traveling in. Uh, like I think there might be just a few students off uh, having someone there full-time. So on the, um, uh, the full-time uh, positions uh, for the other, uh, the community of DILO and for resolution, would those uh, individuals actually be uh, living in those communities like uh, as a member of the, of the, of the community. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Boyle. Mr. Minister Abernathy. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, if you look at the presentation that was provided, it gives an indication of the community sizes. For communities under 75, we're going to be utilized in the travel clinic. For communities over 75, our intention is to have uh, counselors in those communities. So those communities that you're making reference uh, have a larger class size, from what I understand. Uh, what's okay might be changing as numbers change. We, we'll obviously have to modify our approach, but at this time, I believe the intention is to have full times in those communities. Now. 
those are Yellowknife um, and South Slave, so that's later on, that's gonna be closer to the end of this initiative. So there's lots of time for us to work with our partners to make sure that we're, we're as current on numbers when that time comes as we can be, to make sure that we're providing full supports uh, where possible. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Mr. Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I just I, I know that I have similar concerns. Uh, I recognize the logistic difficulties of um, having uh, individuals placed in communities where uh, there are you know, very few students. I recognize that. However, um, we have to uh, wrestle with the fact that that's where they're needed the most, right? So. You know, you have um, the the the, num the the departments themselves uh, in uh, in slide ten uh, clearly clearly show uh, that uh, the presence uh, is needed in the small community. So, I'm um, wondering if there there if there can be a way where um, there the, if an individual is is uh, uh, traveling into those two communities. But I understand that. I, I think I heard uh, Ms. Mueller say that it would be three times a year for one week uh, duration. I'm not sure that's sufficient. Um, if we have uh, uh, making any sort of progress with uh, with uh, with the uh, communities, and I consider this to be, of course, I often talk about the strategic spending of government. I consider this to be. Ex extremely high on the list as far as strategic spending goes. Uh, when we uh, start to address uh, uh, our youth, uh, we have uh, long-term savings uh, or deferrals of costs coming in the future, so this is uh, very strategic. Um, but somehow um, the, the minister <coughs> should, uh, ministers should look at ways to uh, bring more presence of these positions into the small communities other than just three times a year for one week duration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Mr. Abinoff. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, this is definitely a conversation that the departments have had uh, in moving forward with this initiative, and we understand the value of the face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact that our, that our counselor staff will have with, with youth who are struggling. The intention is for them to get into the communities. Um, if we find over time that maybe more time in community is necessary, we're certainly willing to be flexible. We have to be flexible. This is going to be done in partnership with schools, right? This is a, about working together. So if there is a, a challenge in a community where the demand is higher, we're certainly willing to be flexible there because it is important for them to have that sort of eye-to-eye -eye contact and that relationship building to have consistent uh, services for our residents. So we're open to it. We've, we've set a, a level at three now. but. We anticipate that every community is going to have a slightly different approach. We are going into three, into the two regions where the rates are, are high uh, in these areas where we know there's great demand. We anticipate we're going to learn an awful lot about, about the standards we're setting as far as how many go in. They may need to be modified. Uh, we'll certainly be continuing to update committee as we go forward. We, we anticipate that you'll likely hear from your residents, at which point we hope you're going to be sharing that information with us so that we can continue to evolve this to meet the needs of all of our residents over the long term. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, if you look on slide number seven, it uh, describes that uh, for the last three years we've been piloting uh, uh, the program in 10 small communities, uh, and it's been working really well. And uh, further to that, uh, if counselors do need to get into the communities on an as-needed basis, should something happen in the communities, the, uh, the traveling team will get in there as well. Yeah, but as we're piloting this through the Decho and Clicho, we'll definitely uh, continue to monitor and evaluate. Thank you, Minister Moses, Minister Abernathy. And just one last comment. I mean, this is this is one of the tools and one of the initiatives we're moving forward with the youth <laughs> mental health and addictions in the Northwest Territories. We're also going with the with the crisis response network, which is going to be able to get into a community if we do have a crisis, uh, involving people from regions, communities, and centers as well. So we're we're still moving forward with that initiative. They are both important. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I uh, want to compliment the two departments on working together on this. Uh, clearly, the EDI uh, statistics show that we're in a crisis situation, as far as I'm concerned, and it's going in the wrong direction. If you look at the, the time uh, between the two measures there, um, 
this is this is a good initiative, but there's a lot of devil to be worked out in a lot of details. Uh, whether it's uh, you know where these people are actually going to be located in a school versus a, a health clinic, um, the reporting authority, you know how much say is the uh, uh, region or community going to have over where these people are located and what they do and um, you know what the qualifications are and whether we're actually going to be able to fill those positions uh, 49 new positions in four years uh, there's a limited pool of people that are out there so uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done I want to turn to uh, slide 16 though um, there's some numbers I think they're dollar numbers on here although it's hard to tell there's a number of staff positions in the Daycho and the Tlicho. Are those numbers dollars? And uh, it, I, I think they are. And is this money then that is going to be clawed back out of the DEA funding? Because these numbers are different than what's in the budget. And uh, I'm just, can someone help clarify what's going on with this table? Because the, the m number in the budget is $475,000 that's going to get clawed back out of their uh, Tlicho and Daycho DEA funding. But here it seems to be $753,000 for, for the first year. So can someone help me understand this? Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Thank you. And if you look on uh, slide 15, it talks about some of the uh, new investments that we're putting in there and that uh, the education authorities also have to reallocate some some of their funds to uh, Department of Health and Social Services. Uh, maybe I'll get uh, uh, Olin to get into a little bit more detail on that. Mr. Lovely. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, as you are probably aware, the school fiscal year is different than the government's fiscal year, so the amount of funding that we're calling back in 2018-19 is only 60% of the 753000 uh, the balance will be clawed back in uh, the next fiscal year, 1920. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Mr. Riley. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Uh, and look, I do think this is a good initiative. Um, I'm not sure clawing back all that money is uh, necessary, but that's going to be a, a different debate and discussion. But um, what uh, sort of uh, arrangements are there between even the two departments? Is there a formal MOU that exists between the two departments to carry this out? And are the two departments prepared to enter into MOUs with each of the regions where this work is to be done? Because I think if their money is being clawed back, they should have some sort of say over how this money is going to be invested and uh, so on. So an MOU between the departments and what sort of formal agreement or understanding is there going to be with the communities and regions as this uh, rolls out. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, and I will say that this is about a partnership of working closely together, not only with education, culture, and employment, but also the, uh, the education authorities. And uh, I've had a conversation with at least one of the education authorities. I know the Department of Education has had uh, conversations with all of them, but they, they are open to this, and I think they do recognize the value and accept that this is about a partnership working together in all the, in the best interest of our kids. Uh, with respect to a memorandum of understanding, we're prepared to enter into memorandums of understanding as opposed to, say, a service level agreement because this is about a partnership and every authority, depending on the demands that they have and the issues that they're facing with, with kids and youth, not just the ones that are attending school, but all of the kids, in their, in their communities and region. Uh, we're absolutely open to preparing memorandums of understanding, recognizing that they might be slightly different by school and by, uh, by community. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that commitment. Uh, uh, look, as I said, I think this is a good initiative, but there's a lot of details to be worked out in terms of implementation, and I think I would probably even say that it would have been better if it had been developed on a more collaborative basis even going forward. <coughs> I know you have budget secrecy and all of that sort of things you've got to deal with, but i uh, um, glad to hear that you're open to an MOU because that's what I've heard at least one of the uh, uh, DEAs that I deal most closely with wants that. So I'm glad to hear that. I don't have any other questions uh, at this point, but there's a, clearly a lot more work that needs to be done. I'm glad the two ministers are here. And it would be really helpful, though, if we could get regular updates from, this, uh, from them as this rolls out. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Evernoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just for the record, we recognize how much work this is going to take. The department has, active, has been actively engaged, not only with education, culture, and employment. There have been some initial discussions with some of the authorities, in particular the two that we intend to move forward with uh, in the next fiscal year. Uh, it's not just going to take upfront work. It's going to take monitoring and value, and we're putting in a, in a comprehensive evaluation framework so that we can continue to monitor the impact and effectiveness of this approach. And we also have to recognize that there, there will likely be some evolution as we learn more. Uh, there's a number of reasons we're, we're not going out with full implementation right away. One of the challenges is the one the members already identified. Uh, we want to make sure that we can find competent, qualified people. We believe there's people out there in the school systems already. We're hoping they're interested in working for it with us and, and as part of it, health and social services, but we also know we're going to have to go out recruiting. So we want to make sure we find the right people, the best people, the people who can provide the services, and we are working in cooperation with, uh, with all of our partners, and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Minister Evernoff. Um, I do have some questions. I, first of all, the comment is, is that um, I've done my homework on this. I've had long conversations with both ministers uh, and Minister Abernathy on a trip when we were going out there. Um, I have contacted uh, my people and the people I represent in my region, and this is a positive move, and we're one of the regions that's having a huge, uh, well, the first one's going out with it. So I thank the minister and the department for that. As everybody's heard, we've had a huge incline of, you know, um, attempted suicides or suicides in, in my riding, um, you know, six in the last year and 44 attempts that I know of. And, and every time I sit there and talk to the um, ambulance services and that, it's actually higher and higher every time I turn around the corner. So it is a concern for me and I appreciate departments working for that. So my first question though is, I heard in the, the speech, the budget speech, that these positions are going to be in the schools. Um, my understanding, they were going to be utilizing the schools, and then, but also outside because of the the need for it. Um, so my first question is, where are these positions going to be located? Is it going to be in the schools, or is it going to be in the health centers, or is it going to be a combination of? Thank you. And the time frame, or like, when, what's the hours of operations? Thank you, Minister Abernathy. <coughs> The positions are health and social services positions. They will be reporting to the health and social services authority and they'll be have a clinical lead and clinical supervisor to provide that oversight direction to ensure that the services being provided are quality services. Uh, recognizing the vast majority of the youth will actually be in school, we are going to locate those positions in the schools during the during the academic year. They'll be in the health centers otherwise. Uh, they won't spend every hour of every day in the, in the health center because there are some students who, or some youth who aren't attending school who still require services and won't likely be going into the schools. So that's what we'll, we'll work on memorandums understanding to make sure that we're providing the adequate coverage. But during the school year, the majority of their time will be spent in schools and then in, in health facilities for non-school year uh, with, with some crossover time to meet the needs of those who aren't attending school. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, it's kind of sort of answers my second question <coughs> for the, pe the youth that are not in school mm -hmm. like that there um, has been has a huge impact in my region as well um, and so how are these individuals going to be serviced during the school year mm -hmm. like that's the you know the big thing is, is some of them don't want to be in the schools they don't want to go into the schools so how are they going to be serviced or mm -hmm. looked at or helped or supported or counseled. Thank you. Minister Abernathy? As I said, during the school year, they'll be spending the majority of their time in school settings because that's where the largest percentage of, of youth will hopefully be. We recognize fully that there are students who aren't, or sorry, youth that aren't going to school. So we are also going to have some time in the health centers where they can have access. Uh, also, if a student indicates that they don't want to meet in the school, they'd rather be in the health center, we need to be open to that as well because some of the students uh, during some of our peer processes indicated that they're not comfortable uh, being seen going into that setting uh, because people might ask questions. So we want to make sure that we're flexible to meet the needs of those students uh, and those youth, the ones that are in school and the ones that are not in school. Okay, thank you, Minister Abernathy. Um, I guess my last question, and I'll... And Mr. Bolio has a question for you. Um, when you talk about population, and I'm looking at these numbers and that, where is the factor of youth that are between the ages 
that are not in school mm -hmm. and the ages up to 25 because I'm looking at these numbers and in my riding, especially in Fort Liard and in Fort Simpson, the numbers are higher, especially that age group that are, you know, not in school, but also the ages of 18 to 25. And so where is that population brought into this calculation? Yeah. Mr. Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we were, we were trying to have this obviously as an informed approach, which is why the standards were come up with uh, less than 75 students, 76 to 250 students, 251 to 500 and 501 and greater. And if you look at page 11, it articulates what that is. We do recognize that there are young people who aren't attending school. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we have adequate coverage for them. The numbers uh, that, that we believe are out there are, are, there are people, but we don't believe they're huge, huge numbers. Uh, but we're trying to capture those in the student numbers. Okay. Mr. Bullier. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you asked the question that I wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Abernathy. Uh, Mr. Bully, yeah, I'm just looking at the numbers, Minister, and like right now, F Fort Simpson, you're looking at the numbers of 202. There's more than 70 or 80 youth that are between the ages of 18 and uh, 25 in the community of Fort Simpson, and presently you only have one PY. Um, so that there is a concern for me in my riding, um, and so I'm hoping that you guys will be able to look at this um, and actually do some research to show what the, exactly the numbers are in this area. Um, Minister Abernathy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, like I said, we're, we're, we intend that this is going to be a learning experience as well. We hope to be able to, to, to continue to evolve as necessary, and the numbers will likely change over time. Some might go down, some might go up. But in Simpson, between Bompas and Thompson Simpson, we see basically 200 youth. Um, and I don't believe our numbers show that there's 50 more <laughs> youth that, that fit. But if, if, the, if we do get those numbers, we're certainly willing to, to explore uh, our investments. Okay. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. I guess my question is, is youth, you're talking about the school population, and I'm talking about outside. the population that are outside the school, like the mm -hmm. 18 to 25-year-olds. I can guarantee you there's more than 50 youth in that area sure. and I think this if what you can maybe cl clarify with this because this is what I'm understanding this position to be is for youth mm -hmm. which is from 4 to 25 and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's what my understanding is correct so yeah. Minister Abernathy this is uh, thank you Mr. Chair this initiative is more focused on the school age youth we have we have career council we have sorry we have community counselor positions already available for individuals that are outside of the school system that are older like it would have been past their their graduation level those those aren't going anywhere we're not getting rid of those those supports still exist for for young people who are aged out of the school system this is primarily focused on school age youth okay. uh, thank you minister Abernathy. hopefully that clears things up because yeah. i was again worried about the definition of youth and that's yeah. from five, four to 25 so but I think yeah. you've answered the question we, we, we still recognize that there are youth that are school aged that aren't attending school and those are the numbers that we want to make sure that are fully captured as yeah, well they're not 50 I just I don't believe that. those are 50 so, yeah, okay thank you is there any other Mr. Riley uh, thanks uh, Mr. Chair the uh, sort of the whole issue of career development counseling how does that fit in with this and um, are there separate resources for that? Are they going to continue to be uh, um, supported through the uh, funding that the DEAs get, or sorry, the District Education Authorities? How how is that going to be uh, um, coordinated with this new initiative? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister yeah, Moses. Totally, uh, yeah, they're totally two different uh, programs, I guess you can say. Uh, this one's focused on the mental health and well-being of our children in the schools. The career development counselors, uh, as, as you know, we have you're coming uh, during business planning session, as well as Bob going through the main estimates are those uh, six new positions that we're gonna get out to the communities uh, as well to focus on uh, uh, career development and focusing our skills for success uh, initiative as well to get that out. So we, we do have another uh, initiative that we're gonna be coming 
forward with uh, during the main estimates. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So if I wasn't confused before, now I'm really confused. So uh, um, what changes then are being proposed to that uh, um, system of uh, funding the, the district education authorities? And uh, is there some way that it can be coordinated or uh, with some of this new initiative? Uh, it just seems to me that um, having roaming uh, career development officers located out of uh, Yellowknife and Inuvik, which I think seems to be the plan. I don't know why these people aren't in the regions uh, rather than being located in Yellowknife and, and Inuvik. But, um, and I, look, I understand there's a, there's a difference between mental uh, health, uh, wellness and supports and mm -hmm. career development, but there is some links there obviously. So uh, how's that gonna be coordinated and uh, so on? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Yeah, with the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, obviously the, uh, the, the mental health workers here, uh, this is gonna be in partnership with our education authorities and the <coughs> Department of Health. Uh, the career counselors that we were just discussing, uh, going out into the communities, three here in Yellowknife, three in Inuvik, that's a department initiative that we're focusing on to, uh, to uh, get that information, get into the schools and work with the students to uh, meet their needs and help them develop a uh, career path moving forward. I don't know, Sylvia, you wanna add anything to that? Thank you, Minister Moses, Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for some additional clarity, the resources that the minister referenced, those six positions, those are to supplement existing resources that are out there within education authorities and within our regional uh, offices because we do have resources right now in our regional offices to support youth in particular um, with uh, career counseling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Any other questions? Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to thank the, both ministers for coming. Um, do you wish to have any closing comments? Sure. Minister Moses. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the comments and the feedback from uh, uh, committee. Um, I think uh, both Minister Abernathy and myself are very proud of the collaborative work that we've uh, been working on getting these career or these uh, child and youth care counselors into the schools and working with our education authorities. We've really uh, been working uh, throughout the territory and building that partnership and, and that trust and making sure that we provide the, the resources for our smallest communities and, and those that are trying to do the best work uh, in, in the territory. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, thanks for the comments, the feedback, and, and with this, this uh, project here that we're doing, I think uh, we'll continue to monitor and as uh, uh, members have said, we'll, we will keep the uh, committee updated on, on the progress. So thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Okay, we'll let the ministers and their staff leave and we'll just do a brief wrap up. Thank you.